Welcome to the Lean Solutions Podcast, where we discuss business solutions to help listeners develop and implement action plans for true lean process improvement. I am your host, Patrick Adams. Hello and welcome to the Lean Solutions Podcast. My name is Patrick Adams and my guest today is Katie Lebeds. Katie is actually returning. She is one of our former uh, episode uh, interviewees and we appreciate having you back, Katie. Loved our conversation that we had back in season one. Uh, we are now in season two and Katie is back. Uh, we're going to talk about her new book. But just for those of you that did not hear the first uh, episode with Katie, Katie is the president of Learning to Lean LLC. She is a certified Lean Six Sigma master black belt and project management professional. She's been practicing Lean Six Sigma and project management concepts for over 20 years. She has a diverse background that includes manufacturing, materials, supply chain, HR, and IT in the automotive and electronic industries. Katie makes her uh, professional goal to expose the genius in all of her students. I love that. Katie, welcome back to the show. Thanks, Patrick. I appreciate being uh, welcome back. Thank you so much. Absolutely. No, I love love having you on the show. Loved our, our conversation that we had last season. And uh, you've actually authored two books. So the, the first one was How to Improve Absolutely Anything, Continuous Improvement in Your Home, Office, and Family Life. And then uh, your new book, How to Improve Absolutely Every Process, Kaizen for Process Improvement and Fun. So I'm excited to chat a little bit more uh, in depth about, um, you know, we, I think we talked a lot about your last book uh, mm -hmm. last time we had you, you on the show. So this time I want to talk specifically about your new book, How to Improve Absolutely Every Process. So this, this is, I love the, the title, by the way. It's great. Thank you. Thank you so much. Yeah. So tell tell our listeners uh, just a little bit about your book. I mean, what was the motivation behind it? Uh, you know, what's it about? Um, you know, just fill us in. Absolutely. So thank you so much for, for asking. Uh, as you mentioned, my new book is all about uh, Kaizen events and how we can use Kaizen events for making revolutionary change within organizations and how we can also make them fun. So from determining whether or not you actually need an event through creating your measurable problem statement, determining how long your event should be, uh, inviting guests, all the logistics and the agenda and the activities. That's what the book really talks about. And it likens it to a party. So if you were planning a party, how would you plan it? And that's what uh, the book really talks about. It demonstrates how we can bring these wonderful concepts to anywhere in any organization across any industry. Very nice. Well, we run, uh, I, I'm, I've been involved in hundreds of Kaizen events. I can't even <laughs> count how many, but, uh, you know, they're always a blast. I love g a good Kaizen event. Um, mm -hmm. And so let, let's talk about the process. I mean, you, you mentioned problem statements, right? So, you know, for us, uh, we love to, whenever we do a Kaizen event, we, we normally kind of charter that out, put some structure at, uh, uh, behind it ahead of time, which includes putting together a good problem statement. But I mean, what, what for you, what makes a good problem statement when you're going into a Kaizen event? Absolutely measurable. It has to be a measurable problem statement, as you know, Patrick. Yeah. And that to CI professionals is very obvious, but to somebody that maybe has not had that experience before, uh, that can sometimes be challenging. And we uh, have a tendency to hear that we don't have the data for that. Mm -hmm. And it's very rare that I would encounter an organization that really doesn't have the data. Uh, I recently have encountered an organization that may not have had as much data as we would have liked. And you know we can work through that. Uh, but it's really just about having that measurable problem statement. I always tell folks, it's like, if you're going to go on a weight loss journey, right? You have to step on that scale to begin with. And that's what we need for our measurable problem statement. As you know, we need to know what it looks like now so that when we make changes through our event, we know if we've made things better or worse, because sometimes we can make them worse. <laughs> Yes, absolutely. I love that you use the example of of weight loss because I think that's a, a really great example when you think about uh, developing measurable, um, you know, transformation metrics. Because, like, I can say to I can say, well, I really want to lose weight, and or I, I guess or I really want to be healthy. Or, you know, maybe that's your your statement. I really want to be healthy. 
Uh, well, what does that mean though? And how do you know that the decisions you're making are actually making you healthier or driving you in the right direction? And how do you know when you've arrived? If, if you have a, a goal in mind, you know, or, or an, an end goal to be the healthiest person you can be, what, you know, what is that exactly? How do we know that we're actually, you know, moving in the right direction? Um, so by, by giving yourself, like you said, you have to step on that scale and you say, okay, um, you know, I was 180 pounds uh, when I started and maybe the first thing I did was I incorporated a new diet, you know, and then you can measure that, you know, week after week to see if that new diet is actually causing you to lose weight or gain weight potentially, right? right. Absolutely. And, and uh, I've been through that journey myself and I, I love going to a doctor that appreciates data and that you can really be able to not just use the scale for your measurements, right? You look at your whole measurement system and you say, okay, we look at the scale, we look at blood pressure, we look at uh, blood sugar and hormones and all these sort of things that collectively will influence that just like yeah. any other process. Yes, absolutely. And, and again, then, then uh, you know the decisions that you're making. Are they bringing you in the right direction or do you have to redirect or do different things, right, to, to ensure that the metrics that you've put in place are actually uh, showing the, you the results that, you, that you're trying to see? So mm -hmm. I like that. Yeah. Um, another thing that you mentioned was the, the, the length of time for a Kaizen event. Yes. Uh, so what, what would be your recommendation uh, for determining you know, the, the length of time of a Kaizen event? Sure. As I mentioned in my book, there's no magic formula. Like when we talk about how people learn, right, we have visual learners, we have kinesthetic learners, and then we have people that learn by formulas. And in my life experience, and probably with yours too, there's not a formula that you can say that this plus this equals this many days. It's really all starts with, besides your measurable problem statement, understanding what the scope of this is. So how how wide are you uh, going with your scope or how succinct are you with your scope? And it's really being able to go from there. Um, I've seen Kaizen events that I've done in two to three days, and I've seen events that go much longer than that too. So it really does depend. Um, it depends on schedules too. I, I prefer that it is, uh, a Kaizen event that is, you know, obviously one day after another. Mm -hmm. uh, there, there's uh, differences in, in everybody's industry and, and challenges that we face. Uh, so we have to work through all of those other things that are coming into play too. Uh, one of the things that we've been facing recently is obviously organizations that have multiple shifts. And how do we accommodate everybody in a Kaizen event when you have three shifts within an organization? So trying to find that that sweet spot and um, making sure that we're setting everybody up for success. And of course, having the process owner in there is, is so important too. Uh, and then for, for some organizations, they are seasonal. Mm -hmm. so we have uh, one client that uh, multiple divisions and they're very seasonal. Uh, they support uh, many schools and many institutions. So this time of year, things start to really ramp up for them. So this is not a good time of year for them to do a Kaizen event. Uh, we would then focus in the fall when things start to slow back down a little bit for them. Yeah, that's a good point for sure. Now, and you mentioned uh, having the, the process owner in the event itself. Where does... Uh, where what what role does leadership play in a good kaizen event you know that's uh, an interesting question first of all we need to have leadership buy-in obviously for the event so they need to not just talk the talk but they have to walk the walk too and every event we conclude with uh, our report out and we have a list of what we need from you to be successful and i can say without a doubt 100 percent of my events say support we need support from leadership because it's easy for all of us to go back to the way we've always done it. We need leadership to be able to say, you know what, we're just going to try this change and see how it works and don't give up. Right. And everybody always says you don't want to give up right before the good thing is supposed to happen. So we need that type of support. In some organizations, the leaders actually will participate in the event. In other organizations, they do not. Mm -hmm. And it depends on the culture of the organization. If there is a culture in which 
um, leadership it has a, a dominating factor over the uh, attendees and people feel uncomfortable speaking freely in front of them, then we generally uh, will not have a leadership uh, team in there. And we have to work through all of that because if that leader is the only one that uh, is responsible for that process, we do have to figure out um, what the best way uh, for us to be able to hold that is. But I've seen fantastic uh, sessions where I had two, brought two operations managers from a, a facility participate and um, they were able to do that successfully and everybody felt very uh, open and very relaxed in that situation. So you, you just have to really understand the culture of the organization. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and so one last question about Kaizen events, you know, it ties to your book, uh, How to Improve Absolutely Every Process. Uh, what would you say if you could say one thing or maybe two two things that would just cause a, a Kaizen event to be a complete failure? <laughs> if you could pick, you know, one or two things that you would say, you know, if this happens or if you don't do this, then you, you might as well just not even show up because your Kaizen event is not going to be successful. What what would those one or two things be? Sure, absolutely. Uh, Kaizen events that are not successful don't have a steady uh, group of people that are in the event. I get a lot of questions and I'm sure you do too and our listeners do too. Do I have to be present for the entire event? Yes. When we talk about team dynamics, we go through those stages as, as everyone knows, forming, storming, norming, performing, and adjourning. And people don't realize that every time the people in the room change, the team will slide back on that scale and you have to go through it all over again. Now, some teams I've been with, they can get all the way to performing uh, in 20 minutes. Mm -hmm. I've also seen teams that have taken eight hours and they're still not there. And in that particular situation, it was because the people in the room continued to change. We had people coming in and out of the room all the time. Oh, I have a meeting at 10 o'clock and they leave to go to that meeting and then come back. Uh, so I'm, I have some Kaizen rules of the road and, you know, I always make sure that people understand we will take breaks. You will have a chance to check your email. Um, you know, we will have time for lunch and we have to stay as a cohesive team. And it's interesting, you know, as you mature in your journey and you're able to now take a step back and watch what's happening when those team members change. And it really uh, solidifies the fact that you have to have that same team all the time. You can't have people popping in and out. And the other uh, aspect for Kaizen event, uh, if you don't have that leadership support, if you are uh, a team on an island and you haven't really vetted this through, or you are trying, for some reason, you are trying to change the process for somebody else and you don't involve them in the Kaizen event. That is your recipe for disaster. Now, for us as facilitators and leaders, we ask all the questions, we do everything we possibly can, but sometimes we get into a situation where we're asking these questions and saying, well, you know, what about this and what about that? And they're like, oh, well, that's somebody else's process and you inadvertently are impacting them. Mm. Yes. Uh, powerful. That uh, Those are definitely some really, really great points, and I appreciate you bringing those up. One other point that I want to make uh, briefly is that, because you know, I want to move into some discussions around uh, continuous improvement journeys, mm -hmm. and, you know, as a, a, a methodology, you know, applying lean and continuous improvement to an organization, um, Kaizen events are super important, but they cannot be the only way that you uh, are, are working through your journey. There has to be other uh, parts uh, of uh, becoming a learning culture in addition to a good Kaizen event. Good Kaizen events are a way to, you know, take improvements and, and uh, uh, rapidly improve things in a very small amount of time. But again, it's not, those aren't necessarily going to change the culture on their own. Would you agree with that? I absolutely agree with that. It's one piece of your support structure for continuous improvement in an organization. And I always tell people, you know, as you do too, it's a journey, mm -hmm. right? So, um, and there's certain points that if you were to lay this out on a timeline and say, we're going to do a continuous improvement journey, Kaizen would not be number one. <laughs> it right. would not be step number one, at least not in my process and not in yours either, I'm sure. Right. So it is part of the journey and it's a maturity uh, situation too. It's, it's not, uh, um, it's, it's, 
how you are maturing within your continuous improvement journey and understanding the why behind it, understanding or recognizing some of the terms that we're using. And, you know, there's just like we have marketing campaigns for our own business, there's a marketing campaign that happens if you're really going to go through with this continuous improvement journey and make it stick within your organization. The Kaizans are just icing on the cake. Absolutely. Um, so you, you, you know, we, we kind of talked about the CI uh, or CI journey and, and I'm curious to hear what you're seeing in the CI space because a lot has changed uh, since, you know, COVID and, and now we, we got this hybrid work, work from, you know, some people are working from home, some people are back in the office um, and, you know, people are, are starting to get back to, to the way things used to be. And I'm just wondering, what do you see that's been changing in the CI space or, or what trends are you seeing in the CI space? Sure. I am seeing more focus on emotional intelligence. Mm. Well, I am also an emotional intelligence coach, and this is really interesting to see how this is working. Um, so we're taking a different look at the reactions that people have when we're introducing change based on where they are on the EQ scale, and mm. then continuing to develop those that to bring them to a higher level of EQ. If you have somebody on your team that is a lower level of EQ than the rest of them, they're probably going to be the ones that are gonna say, no, I don't want this change. No, they're very resistant. I like the way we've always done it. That'll never work. And that's all low EQ type of thinking. So uh, that is becoming more and more uh, to the forefront uh, during my discussions about continuous improvement with organizations. Mm. So, so tell me more about wh what what you're seeing uh, at different levels of the organization with emotional intelligence, and um, you know what's different from what it used to be versus you know what's happening today. Sure, and I think before there was uh, a greater focus, not necessarily saying emotional intelligence, but people would do corn fairy, people would do Myers Briggs and DISC and all that, and that helps us to understand where we are from a personality standpoint. But emotional intelligence, I think, takes just a different slice of that. And I can't tell you that because you're a leader in an organization, you have IEQ, because they don't all. They really don't. Mm -hmm. uh, and so that's really interesting to be able to see that. And, and it, it can raise its head while you're doing an event or while you're doing training, or just having those discussions where you will hear people within organizations say, oh, we tried that seven years ago, or we failed the last time we did that, and you know, what's it can, what will make it different this time? Mm -hmm. uh, so it's very interesting. We can't make an assumption that somebody um, that is high EQ is a leader and vice versa. Um, also, the fact I think that everybody is surprised at is that EQ is a muscle, right? And we can work and our focus normally is, hey, how do we bring somebody that's lower on the EQ scale higher? But we also have to remember that if you are surrounded by low EQ folks, that you could possibly slide down the scale if you're not conscious and aware of it. So you could go from high EQ to low EQ if you continue to surround yourself with folks that are lower on the EQ scale and you're not confident or strong enough to be able to keep yourself elevated. Hmm. So what are some things that people can do to keep themselves at the the the, the level that they're at? Right. There specifically, there's uh, there are definitely techniques that you can do uh, in regards to just reminding yourself, um, you know, what is what is a positive trying to look for the positive in everything like we've always been taught. Right. <laughs> uh, trying to make sure that you understand specifically that you are in control of your emotions and your emotions can influence those around you. So one of the examples we talk about in class is let's say that we're working together and our boss, Patrick, told us something that we have to uh, give to our teams. You and I might not be completely bought into it. Our teams are going to see right through that. So we need to be able to take time to ask questions with our leader and to be able to find out you know what information we really need to feel comfortable with that before we then present it on to our team mm -hmm. uh, if you present on to your team that either number one you don't agree with it or number two you don't understand it they're going to see right through you uh, and and that's going to um, bring you a little bit down on that eq scale sure sure yeah, that makes sense. And I can see where that would 
uh, definitely be valuable uh, to understand where where everyone's at and and be cognizant of the the benefits of you know of that th those different levels and um, you know this diversification of the team and things like that. And you mentioned a little bit earlier about you know uh, also that being a, a valuable part of con you know be, ha being consistent on your CI journey and not having to stop and then um, and never restart or. You know, that, I think that's one of the things that, you know, I see with a lot of organizations where um, they I think they see maybe CI as a program and they start it and they're like, OK, this didn't work out the way I thought uh, that, you know, lean lean doesn't work. Uh, let's get rid of it and go to something different, uh, you know, and, and I, I have seen a lot of organizations that do that. And, and that's the worst thing that can happen is mm -hmm. for you to get people excited about the idea of continuous improvement and developing a learning culture and then just, you know, basically turn from that and go a different direction. Mm -hmm. um, the, the, those organizations that are successful in their CI journeys are the ones that um, keep you know, pushing forward. And when things don't work out exactly the way that they expected, they look at that and go, okay, what did we learn from that? Now let's adjust and let's continue forward. CI is not a program. It's a, it's a journey. It's a way, it's a new way of, of doing business and, you know, it's developing a new culture. And so the question that I have for you, uh, Katie is, you know, why are people hesitant to either start or like restart if they did have they they, they rolled things out and you know then they're kind of hesitant to restart because things didn't work out the way they completely expected you know why why do you think people are hesitant to to do those things i i think that a lot of it comes from obviously uh, when i work with organizations i ask them if they have ghosts and I'm not talking about Casper Friendly Ghost. I'm talking about ghosts of people past or experience past. And, you know, it's the adage of, oh, well, that didn't succeed. You know, so-and-so tried that. Well, that person hasn't worked in your organization in 10 years. And it's their ghost that's there, right? So mm -hmm. it's going back and looking and saying, just like you said, it's PDCA, looking and seeing where did we stop? So many people go through PDCA, as we both know, and they get to the check stop and they freeze. They are just frozen in fear because what they have implemented didn't work or didn't solve the problem or made things worse. So they're frozen. And that's where their journey ends because they don't know how to go back through the cycle again to work the continuous improvement. Uh, I have also seen that there are some major changes in organizations as generations start to move through. And this isn't a Gen X, Gen Z conversation or millennial conversation. That is, this is reality as we have some people in organizations that are now moving towards retirement and maybe they were or they were not the people that were supportive of having a culture of continuous improvement because if it wasn't broke, don't fix it. So as we see, and I've seen this in organizations as those people move on to something different, then we're reinvigorating those uh, continuous improvement and lean journeys within organizations and with more of an open mind uh, for change and realization that, you know, this is this is all about culture. And there's many organizations that really want their culture to change. Hey everyone, this is Patrick. So sorry to interrupt this episode of the Lean Solutions Podcast, but I felt it necessary to take a quick moment and personally invite you to the Lean Solutions Summit on October 2nd to the 4th this fall, 2023. The theme of this year's global summit is leadership, people, purpose, passion. You do not want to miss this amazing experience with the top process improvement experts from your industry. No matter what industry you're working in, this summit has value for you. The summit offers four different industry tracks to include healthcare, corporate, higher education and nonprofit, and finally, government. Our opening keynote is Chris McChesney, the lead author of the number one Wall Street Journal best-selling business book, The Four Disciplines of Execution. The Op Sisters, Kathy Miller and Shannon Carrolls, the authors of Steel Toes and Stilettos will be joining us as well as yours truly and over 20 other speakers. The final day of the summit is full of workshops and there are limited seats for a tour of Menlo Innovations with Richard Sheridan and Zingerman's Mail Order with Dr. Jeff Liker, author of the Toyota Way. Early bird pricing is now available at Finelink Solutions forward slash summit dash 2023 or you can check the show notes for a link now back to the show
Yeah, no, that's that's so good. And it, it has to be a culture change. It, it can't just be, you know, f- you know, follow these five steps or apply this, these two tools and you'll become, you know, uh, CI certified or whatever. It's got to be a, a, a true change in culture. Um, and, and so we talked a little bit earlier about Kaizen events specifically, uh, you know, in, in the failure modes that that maybe come with with Kaizen events. What about CI journeys as a whole? Um, mm-hmm. You know, what, why do you, why do most CI journeys fail? Lack of support. It's what it really, in my opinion, what it really comes down to. Lack of support. They may. Um, there may be pockets in the organization that are really excited about continuous improvement journey and they're going to go ahead and forge ahead. They may go to leadership and say, hey, we really want to do this. It sounds really great. Leadership's okay, go right ahead. However, leadership's really not on board. And at the end of the day, in order to really make sustainable change within the organization, you need bottom up and top down support. So you need to make that sandwich effect. And you need to be able to have that, especially when times are tough, when there are some changes, even if you ask for what we would view as a simple change within an organization and people don't want to do that, then they're going to go to leadership and say, I don't really want to do that. And here's why. And if they say, OK, you don't have to, then you've lost you've lost it. Mm-hmm. You've lost the whole thing. And uh, I think also people have a tendency to be, as we all know, reactive instead of proactive. And people wait a very long time before they start or re- reinvigorate their CI journey. And we don't want people to wait to the point of, I, I've seen it from an IT perspective, they have a piece of software that is gonna go end of life and all their processes have um, been supportive of the software and now they have a major catastrophe on their hands. and. Let's try to get to be proactive and try to see that coming so that we can not just have all this change all at one time, but we can gradually introduce it. It's much easier when you take it uh, in bite sizes than than to have. Guess what? Tomorrow we are we have a brand new system and, and people will have difficulties with it. We've actually seen that here in Wisconsin. Uh, we have changed over uh, many of our medical professionals have uh, changed over their systems and they are very much in a struggle mode. Uh, they went from one system to the next in, in uh, from a patient perspective in a day and they have really been uh, struggling and, and they moved on to a, a very large major Wisconsin based system and the uh, hospitals and medical organizations that didn't use it before are continuing to struggle today months after their implementation wow Mm -hmm. yeah that that i'm seeing a lot of the same thing as well um one of the things too that that i was thinking as you were talking is uh that there's probably people that are listening who maybe leadership is not involved at all or maybe maybe this is all this ci stuff is brand new to to someone who's listening and they're and they're uh wondering like how do i get leadership you know involvement or how do i get that the, you know the buy-in that you're talking about or how do we get it driven from leadership okay. um you know because there's a lot of people out there that probably want to start a ci journey but you know i see a lot, and i work with a lot of organizations that have these false starts where they people try to roll out lean or, or ci without having leadership approval or 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 driven anything driven by leadership and then they have these false starts where then they have to stop and then you know restart again how can people avoid that what what are some things that they could do if they are you know maybe a mid level manager or you know maybe even a line leader someone that's hearing this and going man i'd really love to be part of this this CI culture or be able to start to develop the CI culture in our organization. So what would be your suggestions on how do they start? Sure. I mean, it's having open, honest, and frank conversations, um, making sure that, you know, wherever you are within the organization, that you have really fueled yourself with knowledge in regards to what this journey means. And sometimes that means contacting somebody like myself or like you, Patrick, and saying, how does this really work? Uh, What type of engagement is required? Uh, A lot of times if we have a situation, and I I have had that in the past, just as you have, uh, where we leadership may be kind of teetering on that fence, 
Uh, mm -hmm. We offer a Lean for Leaders class. It's it's not a very long class. It's it's a tolerable amount of time, uh, around a half of a day. And we bring the leaders in and we talk to them about what this really means for their organization, what things you're going to start to hear, uh, and talk about successes. One thing that has impacted us from COVID was the ability to really go out and see other people's successes within their industry. And I'm I'm trying to encourage everybody and kind of revigorate that to be able to say, if you know of a place that's doing really well, there's some great organizations uh, in Michigan and Wisconsin uh, and around the country that are doing really well with Lean, contact them or work with somebody like uh, the two of us to be able to get in contact with them and say hey can we can we set up a virtual meeting or maybe could we actually come to your facility and see how lean and continuous improvement is working for you uh, i think that speaks volumes and majority i haven't worked with an organization yet that has said no to somebody asking them about their continuous improvement journey so I think that's really important too, that you know that leadership team's not just hearing it from you or reading books like yours and mine, they are actually being able to talk to other organizations and, and have some frank discussions of how did this really work? And you know, what has everybody's always worried about? You know, what did it cost you? Um, one thing I would, I would caution people is don't try to quote unquote sell lean and continuous improvement as solely a way to save money in an organization. It's right. a very dangerous and very slippery slope to go down. Um, money comes eventually. Money comes as a benefit. Uh, it will come sooner than you think it will, but that cannot be your main focus as we need to do continuous improvement because we need to save money. That's absolutely the answer. Yeah, no, I'm in I, I, complete agreement for sure. And I love the idea of benchmarking. We do so much benchmarking. Uh, it's it's always good for, especially as a, an organization who's you know just starting to learn about lean or just just beginning on your CI journey to see what other people are involved with. We we are, are part of a lean users group that shares. They, we do we go tour different places uh, around the West Michigan area and and sh share best practices. Um, so again, if if you're listening in and it may be you know a quick Google search or you know checking with your local uh, lean consortium or whatever it might be, attending conferences, you know that those are ways to build your network and and start to learn about different places that are sharing some of the things that they're doing. Um, I was just thinking another way too um, within an organization is for you to you know, start with what, what's within your control. So even if you, you know, have the, the model area idea or the model machine, like if you were, you're managing a, a small area and you can start to um, deploy uh, some of the, the, the tools and techniques and, and just change the culture within your own team. Uh, and then hopefully, you know, as you start to realize some of the benefits of that, like you mentioned, you know, cost savings being a, a result of the work that you're doing, you know, that could start to catch the eye of, you know, other leaders in the organization that go, hey, what's what's Katie doing over there? And she's doing some pretty amazing things. Look at look at how uh, her her turnover, employee turnover is reduced. Look at how her cost is is reducing. Why is that happening? What's she doing differently than these other areas in the organization? And so um, I don't know if you have any experience with people who've who've tried to do that and, and has that been effective or, you know, do you have any other ideas about ways that people can, you know, start on their CI journey uh, without necessarily having leadership approval? Right. It's and just like you said, it's it start within the area in which you have control yeah. and it's over, right? And I'm a huge proponent also of non start in non-manufacturing. So start in HR, right? Mm. I mean, you just mentioned about employee turnover. That's a hot topic right now, right? In in the way the market is becoming strange and things like that, that's a huge area of opportunity. And typically, I, I'm the one always raising the flag. My background is actually in IT. So I'm always the one raising the flag for start with service centers first and go from there. Uh, those are not typically chosen first because you can't necessarily walk by IT, HR, or finance and say, wow, look at that changed. It's all behind the scenes. Mm -hmm. um, but many times you're going to have a greater return on investment when you start with an area 
like HR in the recruiting process. Uh, you see online all the time of people have applied and they've never heard back or, you know, uh, summer internships, right? We're just about starting that season. You know, how are we as organizations managing and processing that? How are we from an IT perspective? How are we managing our data? And, you know, do you have requirements or restrictions like FAR and DFAR that you have to accommodate? And looking at those organizations, and that's really where, you know, that's more of a self-contained unit, right? We have some external customers uh, in, in internal customers, but start someplace like that. We had one organization, uh, they were talking about the load on their ERP system, and we were working with finance, and we said to finance, can you, finance typically has right, the reports and things like that, they're running continuously. And we said, can you go through and see how many reports are automatically being generated a month? And there were around 180 reports. And we were really concerned about system usage and um, the, the ability to be able to keep up with things like this. We said, well, could you take a month, go through and see how many of those 180 reports you actually use? And the answer was three. Wow. <laughs> So you go back through and say, you know, it was people trying things, letting them go in production and they moved on to a new position or they're no longer there and they've retired and they just started to accumulate. And that was part of then their quarterly process to go back through and see, you know, what other reports are running? Do we really need them? Are they adding value? Mm -hmm. Powerful. Yeah. And adding value, that last point is the key, right? What, what, what's adding value and what's not adding value. Uh, I always, I say that too, when I'm walking through, I just think about, you know, ma a manufacturing plant and walking through and I see, you know, certain things like a, like a shadow board on the wall that is completely not being taken care of. There's no tools on it. You know, it's, they they have trash cans and things pushed up against it. If it's not adding value, just because it's considered a lean tool, but it's not adding value, get rid of it. Like it, it really is not doing anything for you to be out there. In fact, it's probably causing uh, it's probably causing people to to think, you know, what a waste of money, what a waste of time. Why why do you have that out there? Why do we develop that report if it's not? And why am I spending all this time filling that report if it's not adding value? Right, just get rid of it, eliminate it. Make sure that everything that you're doing is uh, is adding value um you know for the organization or, or for mm -hmm. the end customer Absolutely. katie it's been great to have you back on again uh, love the conversations mm -hmm. uh if someone is interested to get a copy of your book how to improve a absolutely every process kaizen for process improvement and fun where would they go to, to find the book you can go to Amazon. So both of my books are available on Amazon, uh, paper copy, or also uh, Kindle or e-reader version. So uh, you can check that out. Also on my website, learning to lean dot training. Uh, there is a link there to shop. And one of the things that we're offering is what we call a Kaizen Go bag. So on that uh, website, you can order that. And it has a bag that has everything that you need to run a successful Kaizen event. Nice. I love that. I love having a kit to bring along with me that has everything I need to be able to do something like that. So that's amazing. Uh, so we'll actually put both of those links in the show notes. So if, if anyone's interested to reach out to Katie or to get her book, you can find the, the link right in the show notes. Katie, once again, it's been great to have you back. I uh, would love to, to uh, have you back on again in the future. Maybe we can talk about couple specific Kaizen events or, you know, dive into, you know, a CI journey that you've been a part of and maybe a model area or anything at all that we can get, get together on uh, maybe later next few months. Sounds great. Thanks so much, Patrick. I enjoyed being here and it's an honor to be able to be on your podcast. Thank you. Thanks so much for tuning in to this episode of the Lean Solutions Podcast. If you haven't done so already, please be sure to subscribe. This way you'll get updates as new episodes become available. If you feel so inclined, please give us a review. Thank you so much.